Welcome to the Joma Preventative Health Podcast, hosted by the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association. We provide you with up-to-date information on health topics geared towards the Orthodox Jewish community. This podcast content is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as medical advice or as a substitute for the medical advice of a physician. Welcome to the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association Joma podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Minkin. I am a general pediatrician and proud Joma member. And today I am really, really honored and really, really excited to have for the second time, Rachel Bayar. Before I introduce Rachel, um, I'm going to say as I've been doing lately, that if you have a topic you're interested in or comments on this podcast, or you wanna be a speaker, um, please reach out to us at health, H-E-A-L-T-H, at joma, J-O-W-M-A dot org. Love to hear from you. Um, also, I want to say that this um, talk um, is best listened to together with the first talk I did with Rachel, we need to talk, not scare our kids about preventing abuse um, many, many months ago. And also together with a talk I did with Dr. Eli Shapiro um, on the Digital Citizenship Project that he runs and Digital Citizenship. So these talks are meant to be listened together. They have pretty little overlap. Um, in the talk with Digital Citizenship, we didn't really focus on online safety and that's what today's talk is about. Um, I want to give some resources. They will also be linked in the show notes. One resource, of course, is Rachel Bayar. She can be found at the Bayar Group, the B-A-Y-A-R group.com. That's her website. And also on Instagram at Rachel, R-A-H-E-L dot B-A-Y-A-R. And she is a phenomenal resource. Um, I really like her Instagram clips, which are very short um, safety tips. Also, there is the Digital Citizenship Project, digitalcitizenship.com with Dr. Elby Shapiro. There is also a project of the Digital Citizenship Program project called Ketertech, K-E-T-E-R-T-E-C-H.org, ketertech.org. And that is not for individual families. It is um, overall tech solutions information for um, communities, I think parent groups as well, um, can look at that website. And there's also safewise.com, S-A-F-E-W-I-S-E.com, has a lot of information about um, talking to your kids about online safety and also has a lot of different um, information about uh, online um, safety programs. There's also the FBI, which we mention inside this talk. Um, I am going to say that this talk does include sensitive issues. Um, so um, this is for a mature audience. And we do talk about the very difficult topic of sextortion. Please listen to this, don't get scared off by that, it's important. Um, and we do mention the FBI's um, information on it. You can Google FBI.gov sextortion, S-E-X-T-O-R-T-I-O-N, um, to get a lot of information about that. And if you do need, God forbid, to report, um, you can either do it online at tips.fbi.gov or call the number 800-CALL-FBI. So Rachel Bayar. Rachel Bayar is a sought-after keynote speaker, trainer, workshop facilitator, and consultant. She is trusted by companies, K-12 schools, camps, and organizations across the country to deliver inspiring abuse and harassment prevention training and inspire those she meets to work collaboratively to create safe spaces. She uses her expertise as a former sex crimes and child abuse prosecutor and a former managing director of the sexual misconduct consulting and investigations division of a global investigative company to effectively help each organization work to create a safe space for all. 
And as I mentioned earlier, she can be reached on Instagram at Rachel, R-A-H-E-L dot B-A-Y-A-R, or at her website, The Bayer Group, which is B-A-Y-A-R group dot com. And again, please do not be scared off by anything I've mentioned already. These are really important topics and they are relevant for all of us. So I hope that a lot of people listen to this. I think that it's a really important talk. Rachel, thank you so much for joining me again today. I really appreciate it. It is absolutely a pleasure to be here with you. It's, it's, it's really incredible because I know that we talked about um, you know, general um, abuse prevention, personal safety quite a while ago, and people should refer back to that talk. Um, but we really need to talk about online safety. And my first question to you is, why don't people talk about that more? You know, I think that in general, it's probably a combination of the fact that as parents, right, for any for any of those that are listening that are parents, right, navigating this issue with their kids, I think that there's an acknowledgement, um, whether it's an implicit acknowledgement or not, that our kids seem to know more about the internet than we do, mm -hmm. um, that they seem to know more about social media, that things move so quickly that it's really hard to catch up. And I actually think that um, we have to acknowledge that the past few years with COVID and the pandemic mm -hmm. and our kids being online more than ever for so many parents, honestly, for so many non-parents and adults, we've just been keeping our heads above water. And part of keeping our heads above water have essentially been allowing kids to use a lot of devices and do a lot of things that maybe pre-pandemic we might not have, right? Or we may have been more aware of. And so I just think we have to recognize the impact of the past few years. Um, and, you know, and I think that people don't talk about it because it's hard to pull back from something that our kids have been doing for so long. Right. There's, there's way too much, it feels, to stay on top of. I mean, there's so many different devices, right? Yep. Yep. And so many different apps. And there's a new app every day. I know when I, you know, do a session, whether it's at a school or, you know, some sort of uh, community event where I talk about internet safety. If I do that same session, you know, three months later, I'm talking about different apps, right? I'm talking about almost different issues because it is such a fast paced world that we are navigating when it comes to internet safety. It's so true. Um, do you think that there are families that just don't have to worry about this because they don't use the internet? Nope. Not even a little bit. And I say this as a parent, my own children do not have social media. Um, and I still talk about this with them all the time. And I just want to also just give a, you know, when I share that, you know, I, I very rarely share um, personal things, mm -hmm. but sharing the fact that my own, I have a, a, my oldest is in high school, does, does not have social media is also not, should not be taken as a, if your child has social media, then what you're doing is wrong versus right. And I want to be very clear on that. I'm using my own experience as an example. Even though my children are not on social media, I still talk to them about it all the time. Their friends are on social media. They're going to be able to see social media. They're going to have access through other people. And especially when we think about it within the more religious world or within the from world, I think there's this... Um, there's this false sense of security. If my child doesn't have something, they won't have access to it. And that's not accurate. If my child doesn't have something, I may not be giving them access to it, but that does not mean that they will not get access to it. And we do our children a disservice by not being the first ones to speak to them about these issues. Right, absolutely. If they don't hear it from us, they'll hear it from the so-called street, right? Correct. I mean, yeah, or or friends or school or summer camp, you know, even in the most religious settings. <laughs> totally. That's what we call the street. <laughs> exactly. It's so true. How do you do it, though? How do you live in a community where kids do get social media early and not have your kids on it? How does that even work for you? You know, I think that first of all, it's a recognition um, from, a, from a personal point of view that um, as parents, we have the ability to parent and parenting is not meant to be easy, right? We all know that. We all know that parenting is actually an incredibly difficult thing. It's a constant um, flow. And I think that just like we make decisions about safety issues, just like we make decisions about kashrut, about, you know, 
implementing certain values, right? When we think about the way that we structure educating kids in general, right? For anybody here who's a parent that's listening, you make a choice as to where your kids go to school. You make a choice as to where they go to camp, right? You make a choice, or if they go to camp, you make a choice about what activities they can do. You make a choice about what things you really wanna be able to provide. And honestly, this is no different. Um, and there have been many times, and I remember as my, as, as being a child, you know, being raised also, there were many times where friends got to do things and my parents said, no, this doesn't align with our values or this doesn't align with what we want for you. And, you know, part of what I have learned about being a parent is being parents, not about being a friend, right? It's about being a parent. And so I think from our perspective, there's been a lot of conversation it doesn't mean that it's always easy, but there is open conversation about values and there's open conversation about where those values play into things like, you know, friendships or social media or where we go to school or things of those sorts. So it becomes no different than any other parenting decision. And I, I also want to put a caveat to that because I think anytime you hear a parent say, well, this is a parenting decision and it wasn't hard and, or, you know, or, or they give the impression that it wasn't hard. I think that it can really make people feel very badly. And I wanna be very, very clear that just because a decision works for one family does not mean that it is the right decision for another family. And I never want someone to take what I'm saying as, well, I should be doing this too. So I just wanna add, um, this is now like the second time I'm adding that caveat into this conversation, um, but I do think it's really important. It's really, really true. And I wonder how you do it with smartphones because you know, smartphones yeah. are becoming the norm. I mean, I think it's like 90% of 12 year olds have a smartphone. Yep. Just, maybe more, maybe a hundred percent. I don't know what the stats are, but it is definitely every single year it gets more and more. Absolutely. So how do your kids not have social media? They don't have smartphones either? Well, I don't want to go into to kind of <laughs> a lot of detail about my kids, but oh, no, I will say fine. that my high school child has a smartphone um, that was received uh, pretty recently. And uh, my child that is in middle school does not have a smartphone and will not have a smartphone. Um, so, you know, I am actually a big proponent of phones that are not, um, that are essentially are not smartphones for kids that are definitely under uh, eighth grade, um, if not even more than that, um, whether it's a flip phone, whether it's one of these like looks like a smartphone, but doesn't connect to social media. There are a lot of options to be able to stay connected with your kid and for your kid to be able to text. Um, that don't involve giving them, you know, necessarily a, a, a smartphone. Um, and then I also think that at a certain point, when you do give over that device, giving over a device does not mean giving over permission for everything that might be accessible or available on that device. I always say a phone is not a diary, right? It's a phone, which means that there's no um, expectation of privacy, right? It's not a right. It's something that you have. And it's something that right now is a gift. And so there are certain boundaries and rules about it um, and certain values that we talk about all the time. And if there was a situation where that would not, you know, where, where those rules were not followed or something of that sort, it's not a given that that smartphone would stay. Um, and again, you know, I think that one of the things is that it's really hard for us as parents that are, and this is not my term, this is a, a term that was coined, you know, many years ago, you know, as digital immigrants, right, as parents that are essentially coming to all of this, almost secondary to our kids who have grown up in this world where this is just a standard and this is what everybody has, that for some families, you know, being able to provide that device and, you know, teach a way to be able to navigate it appropriately may shift based on the age of the child. Um, but I also think that just because our kids know more doesn't mean that we should be throwing our hands up and saying, well, there's nothing I can do about this because we're actually talking about a lot more than values. We're talking about safety. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've seen is not, and I wanna be very clear, the internet is not a bad place. A phone is not a bad thing. And I really think that when we move to extremes, we move to a place of not acknowledging where our world is and all of the really good things and all the really good access that we can gain to so many different things. But just like anything, there are also some significant safety risks. And when we're navigating kids who are 
utilizing any particular app that they want with no age verification. And you have people that are also utilizing those apps looking for kids and looking to access kids. When you think about what's happening even between students and kids that know each other, right? That we're not talking about strangers online. You think about, you know, issues of sextortion or sending nudes or online solicitation. There's a lot of stuff that's happening that as parents, we have to be able to educate ourselves so that we can make educated decisions and so that we can have really educated conversations with our kids. And as opposed to being totally terrified by all of these issues, like I feel like I say sending nudes and sexting and parents that are listening are probably like, no, 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 not my kid. Like that, there's no way that that's happening. Yeah, um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth. Right. We're, we're going to get there because it's really, really important. But that, you know, that feeling of terror, you know, is, is so, I, I want to normalize that. Okay? I mean, that, it's normal to feel like that. And I think we need to acknowledge that we have this fear and we have this, you know, limbic system reaction here. Totally, to totally. And it, and, and it makes sense. And I think we have to name it. We have to acknowledge it. We have to almost like, you know, for, for lack of better terminology, lean into it, recognize it, and then figure out what works for my family in terms of being able to navigate through it and putting our heads in the sand and pretending that these issues don't exist, whether your kid has a phone or not, whether your kid has social media or not, actually doesn't do our kids any service. We have to talk to them. Right, and I wanna talk a little bit about the role of parental controls, monitors, and filters, because I know some parents are like, well, this isn't gonna happen because I've got total control over this. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to be honest and say that, that I think that that's, you know, I, I rarely say I think that that's the wrong approach. I think it's the wrong approach. Um, I think that your filter or your, you know, your ability to put something on a child's phone, you know, there are a lot of different reasons why parents may choose to do that. There are a lot of reasons why parents may choose not to do that. Um, but at the end of the day, it's never going to take the place of having conversations with your kids about what to do when they are faced with something. Filters don't catch everything. There are a lot of security issues with a lot of filters. There are a lot of ones that parents use that they don't realize um, have been and can be easily hacked by other individuals online. So when you have like a tracking on your child and you assume that that will mean that your child is safer, um, if you are using some sort of um, program that has had issues with hacks in the past and you can Google it and you can look it up and you can do research on it, um, you could actually be giving somebody a roadmap to exactly where your child is. When you rely on a filter to assume that nothing will get in, it doesn't account for the fact that kids and teens have a whole language of ways that they text, emojis that they use, things that mean other things, right? And ways to be able to move around those particular, whether it's a filter or whether it's, you know, some sort of program that will let a parent know if something is happening. Um, there's no such thing as a 100%, you know, um, you know, I would say a 100% guarantee that something won't come to your kid. And if we rely on something like that and we don't actually navigate these conversations and give our kids tools for their safety toolkit to be able to come to us when there are issues or to be able to go to another safe grown up, we are, we are truly doing them a disservice. Um, and the other thing is that kids are really good at working around certain filters. And so if we create a dynamic where, you know, we are not totally honest with our kids about what's on their phone or what the expectations are, um, there's a really good chance that your kid will find a way around that. And that doesn't actually work to keep them safe. Then it becomes a challenge. And so nothing is ever going to take the place of a real conversation with our kids um, and nothing is ever going to take the place of you being able to educate yourself on what those safety issues are so that you, if you choose to use a filtering program, you use it as one tool in your safety toolkit and not the only tool. Right. And of course, it's, it's age and maturity dependent. Um, but I like the idea that whatever you do, you're telling them that you're doing it because you're not trying to control them. You're trying to keep them safe. Correct. Correct. And I think that part of keeping them safe and the reason why dialogue is so important with our kids, by the way, whether they're really young or middle school, you know, or high school, if your kid has a device, if your kid is on social media, then they're not too young for you to have this conversation, right? It goes hand in hand. 
And so I think that the reason why we have to be able to engage in these conversations as hard as they are is because if it's hard for you to have a conversation with your child about some of these issues, I want every parent to imagine what will happen when their child gets you know, that random DM in that hidden file that you don't even know about on whatever social media app, and they're not really sure what to do or how to respond, or they think it's exciting, right? So the truth is that if we're handing our kids devices or we're handing our kids access to social media, then we also have to have conversations with them about it. Right, and you just pointed out my the answer to my next question, which is when should you start talking to your kids about online safety? Well, I mean, I have actually taken the approach of talking about online safety before my kids, you know, ever are are old enough or are even thinking about having a phone or anything of that sort. But I definitely think that at a bare minimum, if your child has a phone, if your child has, you know, a smartwatch or a smart device, an iPad, whatever it might be, and they have access to social media or the internet, like that's when you need to, at the very least, start talking to them about it. And you can talk to, to them about it in age appropriate ways, but I also want you to think about what I just said previously, which is if you're handing a child a device and you're essentially allowing them to be on any social media app that they want, then it's never gonna be, like we, we have to recognize that talking to them, the question of, is it too soon to talk to them? Like it's definitely not too soon, right? The minute that they have access is that definitely the minute that there should be engaged conversations. Right. And I, you know, now they're almost born with a chip embedded in them. So they're right. Online from practically birth. It's, yeah. But it's true. Yeah. Yeah. I love how you say that it should be an ongoing open dialogue. I've been watching yes. your Instagram page. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's definitely not a one time sit down conversation. It is, it is, as I like to say, and I think we might have even talked about this in the previous podcast that we recorded. Um, you know, it is small moments of abuse prevention, right? Small moments of of conversations about internet safety, you know. Um, I think it was about a year ago, maybe it was a little bit more, but there was a, a big article on one of the weekend, it was the New York Times, and there was a, a weekend spread about an article about something that had happened with a teenage girl on TikTok, I think she was about 14 years old. Um, and I remember it was Shabbat morning, it was like my morning, you know, opening up the paper, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was Shabbat, I don't think it was Sunday. And it was um, before going to synagogue, before going to shul. And I remember opening it up and reading this article. My jaw like dropped. It was just a horrific article about a stalker on TikTok who had come to this girl's house and, you know, it had devolved and the, the stalker ended up dead on their lawn. Like it was very, just a very dramatic, you know, um, piece. And my kids are not on TikTok as I, you know, as I shared before, but I pulled over one of my kids and I said, hey, take a look at this article. And, you know, my kid sat down and actually read the article and we started having a real conversation about it. And not because that child is on a platform, but because this was relevant to their lives. Their friends are on this platform, right? They're seeing these things, even if it's just from their friends. And I remember, you know, that wasn't a planned moment. I wasn't like, let's have a conversation about internet safety. It was seeing an article or seeing a movie or seeing something on TV and using that as a springboard to say to your child, you know, hey, I'd love you to read this. Or what do you think about this? Or tell me what your initial thoughts are. And we had a very lengthy, very engaged conversation about it, so much so that one of my other kids came over and was like, what are you talking about? And so shared the article as well and started having a conversation about that. And some might say, well, that feels too grown up to talk to, you know, you know, someone ended up, I mean, literally the stalker ended up, you know, dead on, on their front lawn. Um, you know, some may say, well, that's too grown up to talk to a child about, like, that's very scary. But it's very scary to have a stalker on TikTok also, right? And so when we think about the trajectory of being on a social media app, people having access to you, a story devolving into something that is very, very scary, if our kids are on these apps, then it's never going to be too early to talk about something that is being reported or that's seen on TV. And it's a great opportunity and a great option to use that as a springboard to hear what your kids are thinking about this, right? We don't have to have all the answers, but engaging in small moments of conversations also allows us to take the temperature of what our kids think about all of this. 
It's so true. And you're also, you're also able to have the conversation. You're telling your kids, this is not too scary for me to talk to you about. Correct. And you can come to me. And my initial response isn't going to be, I have to take away your phone or I have to take away social media. You know, at, I think five years ago when I was doing talks on internet safety, there were always people who were like, should I just get rid of all social media? And the answer may have actually been very different than it is now, right? When I go and do a parent night about internet safety, I very much say, if your kid already has social media, if your kid already has a phone, the answer is not to go home and say, I'm taking all of this away. The answer is to acknowledge and recognize where we are and to have conversations about it. And part of that is in showing your child you are a person that they can come to, right? It is an uphill battle for a kid to come to any adult, but especially a parent, and tell them about something that happened online that's scary. They're scared they're going to take it away from them. They're scared that they're going to be in trouble. They're scared that something is their fault. And it doesn't matter how open you are and how much of an amazing relationship you have with your child. And I say this as someone who is very open with my kids about this. I still know that it's an uphill battle for a child to come to a parent and say something really unsafe happened or I'm scared because it's scary to disappoint your parents. So the more we talk about it, the more we open up the lines of communication, the more we send the message, I am here. I'm here for you to come to. I am going to love you still. I am still going to respect you. And that is a really big piece of navigating internet safety with our kids. It's true. And I, and I like how you come out and say that straight, you know, that we should be saying that straight to our kids, that message. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I am, I am very direct. <laughs> So a hundred percent. Because kids often have subliminal messages of this is too scary. I'll be upset, mm -hmm. be disappointed. I mean, it's the most you know normal reaction and it does shut down the dialogue. But you also are very honest that no matter what you do, they may not tell you. Correct. A hundred percent. And you know, I always say to parents um, when I get a question of like, what do I do if my kid tells me something, right? Discloses something, whether it's something that happened online or in person, like what should I do? And I always say, the first thing you should do is look them in the eye, pause, take a deep breath and relax your shoulders. And everyone's like, huh? And I'm like, no, literally. And I'm sure that as a medical professional, right? As a doctor, you can relate to yeah. why it is that I'm saying this. I am literally saying you have to calm your body down in order to calm your voice down in order to take a moment and to treat them like a person and to recognize how difficult and complicated it is for a child to come to you and say something. So to really be able to take a deep breath and relax your shoulders allows you to center yourself in that moment and to be able to respond to what your child needs and not the fear and the anxiety and the you know, all of those feelings that you're feeling in that moment, the tears that want to come out, the fact that you are going to want to, you know, I mean, anytime a child comes to us and says something, especially if it's something really scary, right, you're, you're immediately going to have a reaction, which is like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my gosh, right? Like, I can't believe this happened. And that is not how we need to be reacting when our kid comes to us about something like this. They can't be worried that they are going to make our lives more complicated. They have to know that we are their center when these things happen. And I will tell you that I get calls all the time, whether it's you know, people that don't know me, whether it's people that you know, follow me on social media, whatever it might be, or I get DMs all the time where it's like you know, something happened and my child came to me and they were freaking out and we don't know what to do and we don't know who to call. And, you know, this is happening at such a prevalent rate that, that, that scary things are happening to kids online, whether it's some sort of solicitation, convincing some child to send a nude picture, you know, you know, using a picture that's already online and making it seem as though it is nude, sending it back to the child and saying, I'm going to send it to everybody in your school or your family. If you don't give me money, if you don't take more pictures, this is happening whether our kids live in enclosed insular communities or not. And so it is really, really important that we stay calm in that moment so that we're not adding to the layer of immense anxiety that our kids are having and the strength that it takes for them to come to us. Right. And we really need to talk about sending nudes. 
we do. <laughs> <laughs> we do. And you know, when you're talking about that, you know, the word sextortion is the used to describe it. I was quite horrified when I Googled it and the, you know, links were endless. Yeah. And if you even look at like the FBI, like if, if there are listeners here from the United States, but obviously even outside of the United States, if you look at the FBI, you know, site on sextortion, on cyber crimes, you know, it is the the rate of prevalence is just the numbers are astounding. Um, the statistics that we have are astounding. They're changing and shifting all the time. There's been a huge um, influx of reporting of sextortion, which essentially for those who are listening is an online exploitation crime, right? Someone connecting to a child. I mean, it could also happen to an adult, but if we talk about it in a child specific setting, either convincing them to send a photo or a video or even utilizing a regular photo, making it seem as though they're naked, and sending it to them and essentially saying, if you don't send me more or you don't give me more of something, I'm gonna send this to everybody. And in many cases of sextortion, it could be a stranger, but in many cases of sextortion, it could be someone that your child knows pretending to be someone else online. So they actually do know where they live. They do know their family. They do know where they go to school, but they're pretending to be someone else. And for a 12 year old or a 13 year old to, be in a situation where someone is messaging them on a regular social media platform, right? Whether it's Instagram or, or TikTok or Snapchat or, or whatever it might be and saying, if you don't send me pictures that I'm going to tell you, you have to take, I'm going to come to your home and then actually give your address and I'm going to kill your siblings. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is horrific. And it happens all the time that these threats are given. And then kids start to feel like if I don't do this, they know where I live. Like they know that I have siblings. What am I supposed to do? So we actually, we actually have to talk to our kids, not just about not sending nudes, but what happens if you do send one, right? And someone threatens you, or what happens if someone makes it seem like they have a nude of yours, even if you never sent it, right? And we have to acknowledge that this happens and it's not about our kids doing something bad or good, right? Those words shouldn't really play a part. It's about being safe versus unsafe. But we have to talk to our kids about these issues because if we don't, when it happens, and it will happen, and it will happen to so many different kids, they really may not come to you. And the goal would be that if something like that happens, that it gets reported to the FBI cyber tip line, um, there have been many, many instances where people who have engaged in sextortion, both in the from community as well as outside of the from community, have been arrested by the FBI and have been prosecuted. Um, we have to report this, um, and we have to make sure that our kids are coming to us if this is happening. Right, we have to roll back a little bit about what this whole sending nude phenomenon is, because the elephant in the room is your child might have sent a nude photo of his right. And I think that a lot of parents that are listening are probably saying to themselves, no, 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 right. not my kid. Like, no, 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 no. Maybe another kid from like another family, but this would not happen with my kids. Um, and I will tell you that I take the approach um, at both as a parent and as, as well as a professional that I talk to my kids about how we don't send nudes all the time. Again, even though my kids are not on social media, I still talk about this. Um, because I actually think we do our kids a disservice if we take the approach, this couldn't happen to my child. I actually think we really need to take the approach of this could happen to my child. So if it could happen to my child, it could happen to any child. So therefore, let's talk about it. And it doesn't mean that you have to talk about it at every single family dinner, right? It doesn't mean that it has to be a, a topic of conversation every single week, but acknowledging that it happens, knowing how hard it is. A lot of times parents think that kids sending nudes is something that their child wouldn't do because their child wouldn't act in an overtly sexual manner. But sending nudes for a lot of kids is not about being sexualized. It's just about being relevant, right? If my friends are all doing this and like I'm sending it to someone who's the same gender, you know, as me, I'm sending it to my friend to be funny or silly, then like nothing bad is going to happen. And, you know, there are a lot of statistics out there about the fact that, you know, once a kid sends a nude, you know, one in five nudes will end up getting disseminated. Kids don't realize that 
you know, when you send a nude picture, you are creating child sexual abuse material, right? When you save it on your phone, you are, at, or you or you send it to someone else, you're disseminating child sexual abuse material. So we have to talk to our kids about these issues because even if you think it couldn't happen to your kid, think about it from this perspective. Could it happen to a friend of theirs? And what if that friend confides in your kid? How should your kid react? What should they do? Will they come to you, right? If we just even think about it from that perspective, we want our kids to understand and know that this is not something that they keep a secret, right? We want our kids to understand that there is a safety issue that's attached to this. And the only way that they're gonna know that is by having us talk to them. Right, and it really is common, right? You haven't given any numbers. Um... The statistics are changing all the time, which is one of the reasons why I'm not giving the most recent statistics because they're just there's there's been a huge um, there's been a huge uh, almost shift I think in the numbers that we have I think in 2019 um, or 2018 I'm trying to remember them off the top of my head the statistics were pretty astounding and I think that they've gone up tremendously. Um, well, that's the worst direction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think the pandemic did not help with that when it comes to, to oh, sending it online. It's related it, I'm sure it has. And, and also the sextortion component of it, because if kids are doing more of it, that just gives more opportunity for correct. people to abuse it, whether they're you know outside predators or their friends. Right, correct, correct. This is horrifying. I want to bubble wrap my kids. But... <laughs> I, you know what, I, I hear that. And I kind of, you know, there's a part of me that really feels the same way, right? And that really feels like, how do we pull back from this? Um, but I also think that our answers are gonna change as time goes on and as we see what happens. You know, I think about what our kids and this generation are facing in terms of internet safety. And I mean, I didn't grow up in a world where there was, you know, online stuff. I, rem I remember getting a computer at some point, you know, there was, you know what I mean? So our kids are just being raised in a very different world and we are constantly playing catch up, but it's a catch up game that we actually have to play. Right. I mean, we research everything for our kids, right? right? Correct. So research is going to have to be part of this to, to stay like relevant. They're staying relevant, right? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. It's not funny. It really, it's, it's, it's such a hard, hard job and it's so emotional, but going back to those nude photos, right? And if a child is involved in one of these um, sextortion situations and they've sent a nude photo, their first response is, it's my fault. I'm going to get in trouble. And right. parents may even think if I report it, I may get my child in trouble. Right. And you know, what's interesting is, and, it, and I really encourage people to go to the FBI site. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up what the link is. Maybe you can link it in the podcast also. Yeah. Um, but I think it's actually really important to, to go, if you go to um, the FBI, it's cyber, the cyber tip line, I want to say, or even if you Google sextortion, you'll come up with a lot of Q&A from the FBI about this specifically, like what kids and caregivers actually need to know, what it involves, the fact that if there is a child where there's sextortion happening, even if they sent the photo, right? Even if they were in a situation where they took the photo, they sent it, and now they're being sextorted, they're not going to get in trouble, right? Mm -hmm. And so the FBI actually has like a, a whole resources, you know, tips, a Q&A almost, right? Like what kids and teens need to know? How can you say I won't be in trouble? You know, what do I do if this is happening to me? And the line of where you actually report it. And the reason why this website is actually, the FBI's website is so good is because all of these issues and questions and fears that caregivers and parents have are actually being answered on this website by a government agency, right? And so the bottom line is that when someone is breaking the law, when there is somebody that's engaging in sextortion with your child, even if your child sends it, sends that picture and doesn't believe they're being coerced, they are being coerced because the whole purpose of that person talking to them to begin with was about getting those pictures and being able to extort them. And so the situation I, I know like on the FBI website, it even talks about how it can feel really confusing, mm. but part of how people who are engaging in this behavior expect you to act is to be confused, to mm -hmm. feel as though it's your fault so that you won't tell anyone. 
So if you go to FBI.gov, I think, you know, or you Google FBI sextortion, you'll come up with like a really good web page that goes through a lot of Q and A's about this. Right, and I wanna underscore the conversation we had before about constantly saying to your kids, no matter what, I will love you. A hundred percent. Right, no matter what, you know, you did, because otherwise they're gonna feel like I did this, I can't tell my parents, they're gonna kill me. Correct, correct. And by the way, I actually think a really good approach to this is aside from, you know, the constant, I want you to know that no matter what, I'll always love you, right? It's nothing, that love is not gonna change. I actually think that when you're talking about scary things like this, it's okay to say something like, and not just okay, I think it's important to say, I want you to know that if you believe that you did something wrong, or by the way, even if you did do something wrong, right? You sent a picture thinking to yourself, like nobody would ever know, and something really unsafe is happening with that. Or even if it's not, you don't think it's unsafe, but you get really scared that your picture is out there. I want you to know that in that situation, you're going to feel really scared and you're probably going to feel really confused. And even if you're worried, even if you're scared, even if you're confused, I'm still not going to stop loving you, mm-hmm. right? If we even are very direct about these specific situations, then hopefully, hopefully, if there is a time when your child is in that situation, they can hold on to the memory of you being very, very explicit about a particular situation and the fact that you are still going to love them and and that they can still come to you, right? We don't have to be so amorphous when we say it. We can be direct. If there is someone online that threatens you, I want you to know that even if you think it's your fault, I'm still going to love you and I'm going to be here for you. And it's my job to keep you safe. That's my job. That's part of what being a parent actually is. I never want you to be so worried that you aren't going to come to me. Right. I wonder what you think about, because I'm just thinking this is just so hard for the parent, right? I mean, this is hard stuff, really hard stuff. What yeah. About saying to your child, to be honest and say, you know, even as you're doing this, you know, you have many of these conversations, you hopefully get better at it, like as opposed to the one big one. But what if you say to your child, you know, I'm going to admit you, this is hard for me. Yeah. Yeah, you can. I mean, look, I think it's okay to say to our kids when things are hard. I actually think that it's a big piece of building resilience, right? And that's a whole other arena and a whole other area. I think that the the trick is, or, and it's not so much trick. I think that the, the piece we have to keep in mind is that acknowledging that this stuff is hard is very different if our kids see that we can't handle it. Like, it's not that we have to be perfect. There's no such thing as perfection when it comes to this. But we do have to show our kids that when we say it's our job to keep you safe, it actually is our job to keep them safe. So as much as I may be freaking out inside when I know that something is happening in that moment, my job is to be present for my kid. And I can say something like, I know this is hard for you because it's hard for me. But I'm so proud of you that you told me. I am here and I want you to know we're going to figure out what the next steps are. Right. I was talking about during these conversations, not when something actually happens. I think when something actually happens, that's that's a very different situation. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, you, know, you have to pull yeah, it together then. Totally. <laughs> that's the time when you have to fake it if you can. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. You know, we have so much to talk about and I promised you that I wouldn't, I wouldn't go over. I just want to end with you giving us some... Um, positive tip sure. so we don't end on this listen you know I think that I think that everybody that's listening and if you're at this point in the podcast and you've now listened to us for you know over a half an hour then then it's it's great to have you here obviously um I think everybody it's really important for everybody to realize that educating ourselves is not a one shot deal, right? Educating ourselves as parents is going to be continuous. It's gonna be constant, but it doesn't have to be overbearing, right? It doesn't have to be something that is such a burden that we shut it down. Sometimes I'll say, what if you put on your calendar 10 minutes a month where you Google newest social media apps and safety, read an article or two, what are some of the things that are happening? If we break it down into ways that we can educate ourselves, it will make us feel more empowered and less scared, and it will actually equip us to be able to have these conversations. And I want to be very clear. If your kid has social media or a phone and you've never had a conversation with them about this, it is never too late. 
there is no such thing as saying there it's too late. I can't have this conversation. You can. And part of what's so amazing about the world that we live in is there are real resources available to help us as parents. And there are ways to be able to empower ourselves to have these meaningful conversations. And so as opposed to thinking about all of this in a way that drags us down, we actually have an amazing opportunity to help keep our kids and our families safe. And that should be looked at as something that can actually be really positive because our kids are gonna grow up and they're gonna be adults in this world. And if they remember the conversations that we've had with them, they will continue to have those conversations. They will be better equipped in this world. And that's an opportunity that we should look at as a positive. It's so true. And it's, it's a great way to end. And we should just never underestimate the power of our relationship here. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I'm so glad that we were able to have this conversation today. You know, I, I really, really am so grateful. And there's so many more details we could have talked about, but I feel like the details can be overwhelming and a little bit at a time. Totally. <laughs> and totally, so, totally. Resources for that. People can go back and go, you know, under 10 minutes a month. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, or five minutes. Could be five minutes a month, you know, just a few minutes. It's what you can do. It, it, it shouldn't be. We can't let perfect get the enemy, be the enemy of the, as good as we can be. Correct. Um, and, to, and to keep at it. And I want to thank you so much for all you're doing to oh, thank you. keep our kids safer. It, you are amazing. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for this platform and this opportunity. Um, and, uh, and let's keep the conversations going. Absolutely. Thank you again. Thanks for listening to the Joma Preventative Health Podcast. If you've enjoyed this, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share this with your friends. For more information, check out our Instagram at joma underscore org. Check out our website, www.joma.org, that's J-O-W-M-A.org, or email us at health at joma.org.